thank you for joining us today with Calvary Apostolic Church. We understand that we can't gather here together physically, but if you would join us in one mind and one accord as we go to the Lord in worship, wherever you are, whether that's your car, your bedroom, your living room, but this Sunday morning, we're going to go to the Lord in worship and we're gonna invite his presence. So if you would join us in prayer, Jesus, we love you, Lord. We thank you for what you're doing in the midst of this pandemic, God. We understand that you are bigger than every disease. We understand, God, that you are bigger than any circumstance that may come our way. Father, I pray that as we worship you, as we magnify your name, God, that you would minister to your people. Jesus, do what only you can do, God, and I give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. In Jesus' name.
Pastor Rex Secker to Calvary Apostolic Church and thank you for joining us this morning. I know this is all just a little bit different for all of us, not only here at Calvary but uh, across our city and across our, our nation. Uh, thousands of churches are doing exactly what we're doing right now uh, because of the crisis that we're in, the pandemic that we're in, uh, we're having to find new ways to do some very old things. And so I appreciate your patience and I appreciate your faithfulness for tuning in with us today. And we want to have church. We want God to move. We want you to feel the presence of God uh, at home or wherever you are, just as though you were sitting on a pew. And even though there's no pews and there's no drums, there's no piano or organ, there's no ushers in the parking lot or hostesses to greet you at the door, Sunday school isn't going on downstairs. But nonetheless, we're having church. So to begin with, I, I would like to address the reason why we here at Calvary are moving forward with caution in response to the COVID-19 crisis that's taking place. The virus poses several challenges. First of all, we know very little bit about this virus and uh, we have no vaccine. There's no cure. It's highly infectious and the mortality rate is greater than for other diseases uh, such as influenza. It's most deadly for the elderly and those with other health issues and yet we're told that people that have a low risk of death can become carriers of the virus with no symptoms at all and then share it unknowingly with people that are very vulnerable. And Because of this we not only take precautions for our own sake but we're taking precautions for the sake of others. We have to consider our Christian witness we don't want to be responsible for spreading sickness and death in our own community. Not only is there a legal liability for us as a church, but the more important message is that uh, we are, in fact, our brother's keeper, according to the Bible. And uh, we have to be concerned not only about our own friends and family, but about our community and about our nation. The Bible teaches us to obey God rather than man in Acts 5.29. And, uh, but while we're supposed to obey the government, we still uh, continue to proclaim the gospel. <clears throat> the government has not singled out the church uh, with these recommendations, but they're using the same recommendations for businesses and schools and libraries and other things as well. So the church has not been singled out, but we join with a lot of other institutions in, uh, in meeting these, uh, these guidelines. If the crisis is prolonged, then we'll have to consider how to maintain the life and the ministry of the church. We have to remain committed to Jesus Christ, to truth, to the assembling of ourselves together in whatever manner that we are able to. But in times of crisis, we can find creative ways of, of doing those things. For example, we have canceled services due to snowstorms or ice storms. And uh, natural disasters have caused churches around the world to, to have to be closed sometimes for months due to floods or hurricanes or earthquakes. And that doesn't mean that the church stops. That doesn't mean that God is put on hold. It just means that we become creative in the way that uh, we gather together, that we fellowship, and that we reach uh, each other and reach the world. In some parts of the world today, uh, the church has to operate in hiding because of persecution. And yet those are some areas where some of the greatest revivals are taking place in the world today in spite of the circumstances. And the crisis might actually provide opportunities for us uh, to witness and to minister as well. Just this week at Calvary, we've seen three people that have experienced the new birth and been baptized in Jesus' name just this past week in the midst of this uh, shutdown. The Bible says in 1 Chronicles 12.32, that as for the sons of Issachar, they were men that had an understanding of their times to know what Israel ought to do. 
And I would like to think that we're, as the sons, as the children of Issachar, that we understand what's going on, but more important than understanding it, we know what we need to be doing, what we ought to be doing in the midst of this crisis. In Daniel 11, the Bible tells us about all of these terrible things that are going to happen in the end times, in prophecy. And it talks about the coming of this Antichrist and other terrible things that are happening. But when you reach verses 33 of chapter 11, he inserts this little line. He said, in the midst of this end time prophecy being fulfilled, that the people that do know their God shall be strong and shall do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Now, in all of this prophetic fulfillment of these terrible things that Daniel talks about, he said that there is going to be people that know their God, that are strong, that will do exploits, and will instruct many. I would like to think that he's talking about us, that in the midst of whatever happens in these end times, we're a people that know our God, that we're strong, we do exploits, and we instruct many. In 1 Chronicles 7, 14, uh, the Bible talks to us about prayer. And this crisis has caused people to pray as never before. It says in 1 Chronicles 7, 13, If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among the people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Now what's exciting to me about this verse is when people begin to urgently pray for one thing, the plague, the pandemic that's in the land, not only does God move on those areas, but he moves in a lot of other areas as well. And a lot of other doors open, and a lot of other things happen. And uh, some of the times of greatest revival throughout history, when the greatest outpouring of God's Spirit uh, occurred, happened during times of war and famine and disease and natural disasters. And so God can work in the midst of that and do great things and show himself. And so in this message this morning, I would like to take just a little bit of time to look at some of the things that the Bible teaches regarding plagues. Uh, the Bible has a lot to say about pestilence and our response to it. The word translated pestilence or plague or disaster in some of the newer versions of the Bible is found about 100 times. Uh, 100 times, primarily in the Old Testament, uh, plagues uh, were referred to, either prophetically or plagues that occurred. There were the plagues that came when David numbered the people against God's will. There were the plagues that happened down in Egypt when Moses confronted Pharaoh and there was water turned to blood. There was a plague of frogs, a plague of lice, a plague of flies, a plague of boils, a plague of thunderstorm and hail and fire, a plague of locust. And, uh, and so we read about all of these Old Testament plagues that happened and the people were quite aware of these plagues and, uh, that had occurred throughout the Old Testament. In our information age, when we think about plagues, we get hourly updates. Uh, we can tune in to uh, social media or tune in to the major news channels and find virtually 24-hour news cycles telling us the latest about these plagues. Uh, and so these plagues are not something new. Uh, they've been around for a very, very long time. So let's look at a couple of things in the Bible uh, that we find concerning plagues. The first thing that we think about is that plagues in the Bible were often associated with the judgment of God. God sent plagues as a consequence of disobedience and idolatry. In Exodus 32 and 35, it says, So the Lord plagued the people because of what they had done with the golden calf that Aaron had made. And I'm not saying that this pandemic, the coronavirus, is a judgment from God. But what I am saying is that in past, God has sent plagues uh, to earth in judgment to warn people of their ways or to draw people back to him or to see his purpose fulfilled like he did in Egypt in delivering the people. Uh, it doesn't mean that God is judging individuals that are affected by the plague, but rather God is speaking to a population 
the, to get the attention of the population uh, concerning something that, uh, that he wants them uh, to know about. And so if he wants our attention now, I think he's got it. Amen, because there's a lot of people that are praying that haven't prayed for a very, very long time. Plagues are also uh, connected to prophetic fulfillment. Uh, they're mentioned in the book of Revelation in the New Testament when describing the end of days on earth. And many are wondering if the coronavirus pandemic is a plague that might be one of those mentioned by the Apostle John in the book of Revelation. Uh, food shortages, fear, viruses, economic collapse are all things that are mentioned as signs of the end times. Uh, Jesus was uh, asked by his disciples, and all three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, record this encounter that Jesus had with his disciples. And he was asked uh, by them about things that would accompany the end of time before his second return. And uh, they asked him, uh, will there be any warning ahead of time? And this is what Jesus said. Listen to this. Uh, he replied, don't let anyone mislead you. For many will come announcing themselves as the Messiah and saying the time has come. But don't believe them. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars beginning, don't panic. True, wars must come, but the end won't follow immediately. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be great earthquakes and famines in the lands and epidemics and terrifying things happening in the heavens. And so Jesus is telling us that at the end of time, before his second return, and I believe that we're at the end of time. I believe that we are nearing the second return of Jesus Christ right now. I absolutely believe that. If you have been with us the last uh, uh, month and a half to two months at Calvary on Wednesday nights, we've been studying prophecy and we've looked at Ezekiel 37 and 38 and Ezekiel 39 about how Israel would be scattered as a nation and then brought back. And once they're brought back and reassembled as a nation, that that would become the benchmark uh, in which a number of end-time prophecies would be fulfilled uh, following that. And we know that Israel, at the beginning of this last century, came back to the land of Palestine. We know that in May 1948, Israel was reestablished as a nation. And, uh, and the prophecies of Ezekiel 37 uh, were fulfilled, and we are now in the prophecies of Ezekiel 38 and 39, among many other prophecies. Luke 21 uh, also being fulfilled concerning the city of Jerusalem. Um, and so I believe that we're living in end times. I believe that. And Jesus is saying here in the Gospels that the end times will be marked by pestilences and plagues and epidemics and earthquakes and things happening in the heavens. Now, Jesus said it. Now, we, we like to pick and choose the words of Jesus that we like and ignore the ones that we don't like, but you really can't do that. Jesus' words are not a buffet where you just go put on your plate what you like and you leave off the things you don't like. Uh, Jesus said these words, and if we believe in Jesus and we believe that his word is true, then we have to believe these words as well as all of the rest of the things that he said. And uh, and, and so he warns us that these things are happening. In Revelation 15 and 6, it says, And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen. And so Revelation talks about seven plagues. Is the coronavirus one of the seven? We don't know. We're not sure about that. But we do know that if we're living in prophetic times, we should expect plagues. We should expect earthquakes. We should expect these natural disasters, some of them that are going to be happening in the heavens as well. And in fact, we should be surprised when there are not plagues and there are not earthquakes. Because if we really believe that the Bible is the Word of God and that the Bible is true, the Bible tells us that these things are going to happen and they are happening. And they confirm the Word of God, but we also expect them because the Word of God tells us to expect them. They're part of prophetic fulfillment. And then what really brings this crisis home to us is the whole notion that the coronavirus reminds us of, uh, and that is of our mortality. We live in broken bodies in a sinful world. God didn't bring sin and sickness into the world 
but man brought it in through disobedience. God created a world that was free of sin and free of sickness, uh, but it was also a world where mankind had free will. And it was because of that free will that they were allowed to disobey God. And when they disobeyed God, they broke the world and they brought in death. And that's why the coronavirus is so scary. Uh, it's scary because it reminds us of our own mortality. It reminds us that we're broken people in a broken world that is a world of sin. And because Adam sinned, we're in mortal bodies. And that means that death for all of us is inevitable. It can't be stopped. One man said, I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> When the Spanish flu killed 100 million people between 1918 and 1920. Can you grasp that? 100 million people. My great-grandmother was one of those that died of the Spanish flu. Very few people had any idea what the disease was, where it came from, how it impacted others. And now today, the Center for Disease Control estimates that up to 49 million Americans contracted influenza this past year and 20,000 to 50,000 have or will die of the flu in America this year, which is actually good news because their original estimates were around 80,000 that would die. And so there's a lot of death. It's not just coronavirus. Um, there's influenza and there are a lot of other things out there as well that could affect us. And so we are reminded of our mortality and yet, as Christians, Paul lets us know in 1 Corinthians 15 that we should not fear death if we know the Lord. He writes, and this is the amplified version of the Bible, For since it was by a man, Adam, that death came into the world, it was also by a man, Jesus, that the resurrection of the dead has came as well. And then I love what he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 19. One of my favorite verses of the Bible. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. So we're reminded our hope is built on something that goes far beyond this world. And, uh, and that brings us encouragement and strength. And yet death is the fact of life that we usually don't want to think about. William Shakespeare said, the world is a stage and everyone has their entrance and everyone has their exit. This plague likely has affected someone that you know We've had pastors and pastors' wives have infected, and some have already passed away of the coronavirus just this week. We've heard of sports heroes and famous actors and politicians around the world, not just in America, but politicians around the world that are infected with the virus. Uh, this virus affects singers and poor people, rich people, old people, young people, many of them which have tested positive. And the inevitability of death reminds us of two things. And I want you to hear this. Uh, first of all, it reminds us that if we're going to die, then we need to live life to its fullest every day because every day could always be the last day. Steve Jobs, who was the founder of Apple Computers and Disney Pixar, one of the wealthiest men ever to live on Earth, one of the most successful men to ever live on Earth, said this before he died of pancreatic cancer. Being the richest man in the cemetery doesn't matter to me. Going to bed at night saying we've done something wonderful, that's what matters to me. I remember Brother Charles Grisham said many years ago, and it stayed with me, and I've tried to follow this. He said that every day, every day of our life, we should try to touch God, touch a project, and touch somebody else's life. Don't live life every day like you're sitting in the waiting room of a funeral home just waiting on them to call your number. Today, there's somebody to touch, somebody to love, a new lesson to learn, a new song to be sung, that, that this is a reminder to us that every day is a gift from God. And with the quarantines and shutdowns, we're reminded that our life really isn't just about our job or our school or our schedule or the things on our calendar. They can all be canceled because there are things that are more important than even those things. Uh, thank you, plague. Thank you, coronavirus, for reminding us that we're all going to die 
And because we're all going to die, we want to make sure and live while we still have breath in our bodies. Psalms 18 says, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and we'll be glad in it. Amen. Every day we ought to wake up thinking, this is a new day that God has given me. And I want to experience something today like I've never experienced it before. I want to touch somebody today like I've never been able to touch a life before. I want to touch God today. Amen. Right now, there, there are people so worried uh, about Walmart running out of toilet paper that they can't even sleep at night. <laughs> Do you know that the majority of the population of the world doesn't even have toilet paper ever? Not just during a crisis, they don't ever have toilet paper. Do you know that for thousands of years of man's history, toilet paper wasn't even invented? And yet, all of a sudden, people feel like if they can't get their allotment of toilet paper from Walmart, that the world is going to stop turning. <laughs> there are a lot of things that we think that we can't live without that most people around the world don't even have to start with. Our necessities would be their luxuries. And so we can be so worried about tomorrow that we forget about today. In Matthew 6, 25, Jesus said, Therefore I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, or about your body, what you'll wear. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And you, you're not much more, you are much more valuable than they. Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So don't worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Pretty wise words from Jesus Christ himself uh, to us. Let's think about today. And then second, the fear of death, this whole mortality that coronavirus has reminded us of, reminds us to be ready for that day that we leave this world. I don't want to make any assumptions about eternity. I want to be ready. The Bible is full of fear nots. There's many times in the Bible it says, fear not, fear not, fear not. But there is one place where Jesus actually says to fear. It's in Matthew 10 and verse number 28. It says, fear not them which can kill your body. The coronavirus can kill your body or an earthquake can kill your body or a car wreck can kill your body. He said, don't fear those things because they're not able to kill your soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Jesus is saying that our real fear is not those things that hurt the body, but the things that affect us for all eternity. The fear of death reminds us to be prepared for what lays beyond. I'm not hoping that God will overlook uh, or ignore my lack of preparation or look the other way when, uh, when it comes to that day of judgment or that he'll make an exception and just let me in anyway. In Matthew 22, Jesus tells a parable of a man that prepared a feast for his son's wedding. And he, he puts it this way. He says in verse 8, Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find, bid them to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guest, he saw there was a man which did not have his wedding garment on. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here not having a wedding garment on? And the man was speechless. Apparently, a wedding garment was something that was provided at the door that, that you didn't have to have your own. They provided one for you. And you had to have it in order to come into the wedding feast. And yet this man, for whatever reason, 
Maybe he thought that it wouldn't fit or it wouldn't look good on him or he just didn't want to wear it or it was too hot that day or, or whatever reason he had, we don't really know. But he had not taken advantage of the wedding garment which was provided to him. And that wedding garment is a type of the new birth plan of salvation that it's provided, it's free. And, uh, and all we have to do is just obey it, amen. And so the king not only did not allow him into the wedding feast, which is a type of heaven, but instead he said to his servants, verse 13, bind the man hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see, if death is inevitable, then I want to be ready for when it happens. I wanna make sure that I've repented of my sins. I wanna make sure that I've experienced the new birth, born of water and born of spirit. I wanna make sure I've got my wedding garment on and that I'm ready. And so in conclusion, as we wrap this up, uh, I, I love what many people have sent me this last week. It's an excerpt from Psalms uh, chapter 91. And if you haven't read Psalms 91 this week, you need to get your Bible out and, and, and read that, maybe read it every day. It's a beautiful passage. And, uh, and this is how it reads. Psalms 91, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. Surely he will deliver me from the snare of the fowler and from the noise and pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings thou shalt trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night nor the arrow that flies by day nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness. But in the Living Bible, I like it even better how it reads. Listen to the Living Bible. It says, the same passage, God alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I'm trusting in him. For he rescues you from every trap and he protects you from fatal plagues. He will shield you with his wings. They will shelter you. His faithful promises are your armor. Now you don't need to be afraid of the dark anymore, nor fear the dangers of the day, nor dread the plagues of the darkness, nor disasters in the morning. For though a thousand may fall at my side, though 10,000 are dying around me, the evil will not touch me. How then can evil overtake me or any plague that come near? For he orders his angels to protect you wherever you go. What a beautiful word of comfort. This is a time that people ought to be turning towards God and not away from God. It's a time to grow, grow closer, not colder. It's probably going to be, and I'm going to be very upfront with you, it's probably also going to be a time of sifting that determines your Christianity. Uh, when you're no longer in a crowd with somebody pushing you or pulling you along, can you still live for God? Are you still going to pray? Are you still going to be faithful? Amen. And I think this is going to be a time that, that we're going to grow stronger, or in some cases people are going to grow a little bit weaker. Um, because it's going to be a time of sifting. We're praying for you. You're in our prayers. Please keep us in your prayers. In the coming days, we will announce what we're uh, doing so far as our services on Wednesday and Sunday and our other activities. So uh, watch very closely our church website, our church social media sites, and we'll give you that information. Uh, but we're looking forward to what the Lord is going to do in the midst of this. God bless you. We love you all.